Balance your trading strategy by adding futures. CME Group helps you manage risk and capture opportunities in all market environments. Capitalize on around-the-clock access to highly liquid global futures and options market across all major asset classes. Just visit your online broker and get started. Plug into valuable educational materials and trading tools and see what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash on the tape. Risk Reversal Media would like to welcome iConnections, the world's largest capital introduction platform in the alternative investment industry, as a presenting sponsor of On the Tape. iConnections brings the asset management community together through a membership platform that lets allocators and managers meet and connect both physically and virtually. iConnections came to our attention in 2020 during the first wave of the pandemic. That's when their first event, Funds for Food became the largest virtual cap intro event in history. To date, they've donated nearly $2.5 million to charities. They are also the people behind the alternative investment industry's largest and most exciting in-person events. From their annual Global Alts event in Miami to the upcoming Digital Assets Forum this June, the first of its kind designed to bring institutional investors into the world of crypto. To find out more about iConnections events and their members-only platform, visit iConnections.io. June has always been an odd month for me specifically, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Hockey season coming to an end, NBA playoffs coming to an end. We're sort of at the, I don't know, halfway point of the baseball season. Not really, but we're getting there. But the one thing that really gets me agitated is the days are quickly starting to get shorter. Something called, I don't know, Danny Moses, like the vernal equinox or something like that. Whatever the hell it is, it's happening over the next week or so. And I always find that interesting. It seems to come very quickly. And I say that because there are a lot of things that are happening extraordinarily quickly here in the market, Danny, not least of which the housing market turning right before our very eyes the bond market moving right before our very eyes. And quite frankly, the rug being pulled, I think, from the market right before our very eyes. So as I sit here on the eve of the Stanley Cup finals, on the eve of the vernal equinox, it strikes me that maybe the clock is in fact striking 12 for a number of things. There has been a market shift in this market in the last kind of week or two. And what I'm seeing is kind of the give up. You're starting to see, all right, I'm going to buy this back. I'm going to stay in the stock and then the give up. And you keep getting punched in the face. And I think the reality of the Fed not having our back is here. We're going into a Fed meeting next week. The ECB meeting, which happened earlier today, talked about raising 25 basis points. By the way, people thought it could have been 50, 25 and ending their QE on July 1st. That was the reason. If you think back last week, we were talking about the dollar why it weakened a little bit and why the euro was strengthening. That was it. That was coming. And I don't know what people are looking at or watching because we are entering, as the World Bank just said, a potential stagflationary environment. Not that the World Bank, they're always behind the curve. But in general, when you start to think about it and you start to think about the companies which are giving you information in real time, basically pre-announcing quarters, in some cases giving information that leads to you lowering numbers or outright pre-announcing. We're going to talk about some of those companies in a minute. How many punches in the face does it take to realize The Fed doesn't have your back. And I am seeing, finally, the parts of that that are occurring. It's painful, but we're now here. We are going to invert on the 210. We are now at 20 basis points as we sit here today, I believe. I see that happening very, very soon. And maybe that's the signal or that's the final nail in the coffin, as we say, for people to realize what we're up against. And again, I don't want to overly bearish here, but I'm just picking up on the tone of the market and I'm letting it come to me. I'm not forcing it. I am watching things occurring in real time. And that's what I see right now. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of things that people don't see just yet. And the one that seems very obvious to me, we saw that claims number. So today's Thursday, we're an hour into the close. That's starting to tick up. And the fact that if you've been discounting the messaging that you've seen from so many companies, first in the private tech market, but now out of some major U.S. tech companies, they're slowing hiring, they're 
laying off salaried workers. That's going to put downward pressure on wages. The wage inflation was the thing that was helping battling food and energy inflation as it relates to consumers in a way. And, you know, we had David Rosenberg on last month, and I quoted this, I think, earlier in the week on maybe Fast Money or something. But David said to us, when the unemployment rate rises three or four tenths of a percent from a low in a period like this, it almost always certainly is followed by a recession. And the other one that I quoted yesterday on Fast Money is that if you go back to 2020, 2008, you go back to 2000, 1990, 1980, 1974, when crude oil has risen 50% above trend, again, a recession's always fault. So I guess the point that I'm making is a recession doesn't exactly equal bear market, but the stock market will start to anticipate that slowing economy. And so for me, as we're sitting here right now with the S&P down 14.5%, it was down 20% at its lows last month, and the NASDAQ down 24%, it was down 30% at its lows last month. There is no way that all of this uncertainty about Danny's point about what the Fed is doing now, what the ECB is doing, that that is all priced in. We haven't even seen the tip of the iceberg about major U.S. corporations downgrading their guidance, earnings estimates coming in, revaluation, right, of everything, and unemployment ticking up. The one thing that upsets me, and listen, I'm always seemingly exercised, but, you know, the things that are coming to fruition right before our very eyes are the things that Danny Moses was talking about literally this time last year. And, you know, a lot of people say being early in our world is wrong, but in this case, being early was being spot on in terms of what you saw, this stagflationary environment that all of a sudden people from the World Bank are coming to grips with. And, you know, what kills me and what really infuriates me is somebody like Janet Yellen basically just throwing her arms up and say, yeah, we got this one wrong. They all seemingly got it wrong. The problem is, collectively, we put our fate, our economic fate, to a certain extent, the company, the country's fate in their collective hands. And that's problematic. And I'll say this, you know, they have found themselves, central bankers, in a position that they, I don't think they can extricate themselves from. And Danny, I'll ask you this. Are they going to blink? You know, is something going to happen that makes them blink, which takes the pivot we saw in November and they pivot again? And if, in fact, they do pivot, what does that mean? I think it'll take a lot more pain and evidence in order to. And I think if people are holding on the stock market and thinking, I got to be there for when the Fed blinks, that's not a great strategy. Right. I mean, because even if they blink and the market will, it will rally. I think it comes back in again. And what's going to make them blink? Obviously, I actually believe the economy is slowing much faster than they're even paying attention to. Let's not give them credit for anything, for for seeing anything. And Yellen, you know, whatever it was months ago saying it was transitory or late last year saying we still think inflation will come in, now saying inflation is a problem. People are going to watch oil completely because it seems to be the biggest culprit. It's the culprit for inflation. It's the culprit for the consumer. Specifically, if you look at what the retailers are telling us, food and energy, which is we know is not measured all the, you know, we see inflation, X food and energy, but Food and energy is eating up discretionary income, end of story, period. And that's what's happening right now. So oil being high, as we've talked about this for months, is is a tax on the consumer, right? It's an automatic tax. How much is the Fed paying attention? What are they going to try to do? They're going 50 next week. I believe they're going to be overly hawkish again with that. And if they were to pivot now, I think they lose all credibility. If they pivot, I think it's going to be later in the summer. And Dan, I just want to say something, a point you just made. You actually said, one thing right, and I think one thing wrong. You said wage inflation is coming down. No, job losses happen while wage inflation stays high. So the people that don't get fired are still making, maybe I'm wrong because you don't Maybe, I, I, dis- know. I disagree with you but, calling me wrong. I, what no, no, I'm no, saying no. is, but if retailers are going to start laying off people, th- that low end, that's where you saw wage inflation. And that was the concern about food and energy. That's what eats into that demographic, into their no, buying I, power. What I'm saying is that's the stagflation, right? Because whoever stays on is high wages, whoever gets laid off, the economy slows down. I'm saying it's a that's a wicked combination because yeah. you either get fired, right? You don't lower wages. People don't say, oh, you're no longer making 22 an hour, you're making 18. They just fire you. That doesn't happen. So I'm saying, I think we're saying the same thing, but I just wanted to mention, I, I think wage inflation is still here. I don't know. I mean, in these periods, you know, think about all these companies who invested in logistics and, and technology. and stuff. That was the deflationary force prior to the pandemic. And this is the period in which in recessions where they start to get leverage out of that, right? And then when you come out of a recession, that's where you really start to flex. So all the wage gains that we've seen have predominantly been on the low end. So I just don't think that those jobs, they're, they're really vulnerable right now, and they may not be here when we come out of the pandemic. 
pandemic. To your point, wage inflation hasn't even kept up with real inflation. That's a great point. I mean, we still have negative real wages in this country. That's a problem. So as inflation's run amok, by the way, again, and I don't want to belabor this, but you know, we talk about real inflation in this country being 8%. Let's just make a round number. The real number is probably closer to double than that. And people are feeling it. And people are a bit exercised, as I typically find myself each and every morning. But Dan, something you said months ago is also starting to come to fruition. These companies are pre-announcing now, and you're starting to see it across a spectrum of industries. So it's not just Microsoft. We're seeing it across a wide swath. And then you're seeing retailers seemingly getting it wrong. It's not just Target and Walmart. It's coming in the form of a five below, which I know is not an important company. But when you see year-over-year inventories of 54% year-over-year inventory gains, I mean, that's catastrophic for these companies. And one has to wonder, at what point does it manifest itself into earnings? And at what point does it manifest itself into a stock market that might be, again, on the precipice of something? Yeah, on the earnings front, I mean, here we are. Earlier this week, we just had Intel CFO speak in a conference. It was kind of like a talking down the quarter. You know, if you guys all recall, all these semiconductor companies used to give mid-quarter updates. It was like the first week of the last month of each quarter. And it was an event. You had it on your calendar. You knew that they would kind of adjust their guidance accordingly to the way the quarters were coming. The fact that we have seen a couple pre-announcements, some, you know, soon after Target, Snap, soon after they had just guided, I think the main takeaway right now is the speed in which the environment is changing is scaring the shit out of the sea level suite. And so I think that over the next couple of weeks before the quarter ends, we could see some other very prominent pre-announcements. I'll also throw Jamie Dimon's change of tune, the economic hurricane. And he had just spoken, what, five or six weeks ago on their call. And then they had an analyst day just a few weeks ago. He could have said that at the analyst day, didn't say it then. So the way I'm seeing this in this playing out very similarly to 08 and actually 2000 in a way is that a lot of corporates, they're going to keep their cards close to the vest. And then when things become blatantly obvious to them about their lack of visibility going forward, that's when they have that kind of come to Jesus moment. And then the fact that we had a company like Microsoft, I really believe that they took one in the chin for mega cap U.S. multinationals by doing that as it relates to the dollar. I didn't think they needed to pre-announce based on those numbers. I think the guidance for the current quarter is going to be bad. And I think they're going to guide for their full fiscal year going to be bad. I think you're going to see it out of Apple. There was a couple calls this week. The acts in the stock, Katie Huberty at Morgan Stanley, she thinks they're below plan. There's a lot of analysts are going to come out after that. So to me, you know, keep an eye on, uh, on, on the Google. I don't know how what Snap had to say. Wouldn't be something there. Amazon has a huge retail business. They also have a huge ad business. Also, oh, you remember AW? AWS, if all of these private VC funded tech companies are paring back, trying to rationalize costs, some are going out of business. Well, that means they're using less servers. Let's go to Amazon for a second. You bring up AWS. So Dave Clark, who's been at Amazon since 1999, he's leaving the company for Flexport. So Dave Clark literally is in charge of 75% of Amazon's business. It's the, it's the fulfillment centers. It's the goods. It's everything. Flexport, where he's going to become CEO, is a logistic software company that helps cargo enter in a rational right, that fills up the containers in a way and whatever. I find that very ironic. But Dan, you just mentioned AWS. Amazon, I'm not looking at the stock right now, but got lost in, you know, kind of that stock split on Monday or whatever when it happened and the euphoria around that, I think obfuscated what's really going on. Amazon hasn't reported a solid quarter, correct me if I'm wrong, in a few quarters at this point, right? right. Okay. So that to me, stock is very vulnerable here. It's not cheap. And for Dave Clark to leave, people are leaving Amazon right now. So to me, that's scary. Back to Intel. It's the stock is lowest it's been since October 2017. That's pre-pandemic. That's a long time ago. Target, you just made the point. They're not selling home goods and clothing. Mortgage applications, 22-year low. It was just reported, okay? This is all kind of connected to a degree. One's on the enterprise side and one's on the consumer side. What's Target going to do with all their spring inventory of clothing? You have to mark that down and get rid of it. The style changes next year. Like, that's a big thing. And I guess most surprising to me, again, we saw this with Walmart a month ago. How are these companies being caught this off guard? So if you want to tell me, is the Fed wrong? Will things slow down sooner than I think? Yes, because these Fortune 500 companies are seeing it. Yeah, but things are going to slow down without question. I mean, the data that we've seen over the last couple of weeks has been soft without question. The problem is the energy market, at least as we're taping this right now, has not got that memo. So to your point from a year ago, you'll have softening economic data. I'm convinced of that. But you have this inflation that, yeah, may have peaked, but I'll say it for the hundredth time. 
I think it's going to continue to be both persistent and pesky. And I'll throw this in the mix as well, because why not, Danny Moses? U.S. credit card debt is approaching, get ready for this number. And, you know, we talk about these numbers like they're meaningless. $1 trillion. I think it's either side of $900 billion right now, and that's trending the wrong way in an environment where interest rates continue to go higher. So how does that work itself out? Because all I hear from people that come on the network is the consumer's never been in better shape, the consumer, money on the sidelines, all this bullshit, which I don't think is particularly true. I think it's lazy, but I don't think it's true. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's an easy one. I will say this, and and we've had this conversation on a few occasions. There's a lot of prominent strategists who track investor sentiment fairly closely. And I don't know about you guys, but everybody I talk to is an investor, both self-directed or institutional runs real money. They're really bearish and they've been really bearish all year. And that's the sort of thing that I know a lot of strategists point to is like AAI numbers and all that sort of stuff. It's like, so sometimes when the sentiment gets so bad, it's actually good for the markets. I'll say this about the consumer and and guy you just mentioned, I think in April, revolving credit card debt here in the US topped 1 trillion. That's back to like a pre-pandemic level. I do think it's interesting that Apple had their WWDC, the Worldwide Developers Forum. They announced a lot of new products. They announced new updates to their iOS. But Danny, it's this one product, and you and I were talking about it. I, I think you, uh, what, what do you call it? BN, BL? By now, uh, pay later, oh, which, I called, which I called oh. short now cover later oh, back yeah. in the fall. Okay, <laughs> so so I thought it was really interesting given the, the just kind of consumer landscape and the margin that this company has on their smartphones, on their hardware, on all that sort of stuff, that they would be going into a consumer finance product. Talk to us a little bit about that and how that meshes with your thesis on some of these independent names, whether it be a firm or Klarna or or some of the thing after pay and stuff like that. Yeah, so part of it is just on their devices, right? So I you know, I think they're going to use Goldman Sachs and Mastercard Rails for the longer term buy now pay later, but this Apple Pay later is really a 6-week product with four payments. And their ability to see that consumer that's already had downloaded iTunes has used it in the past. They they can get a pretty good idea from the credit, and we know there's certain Apple customers that are buying certain things that are probably at the higher end of the consumer spectrum. So not a bad product, but let me just back up for a second what it tells me about Apple and the action on Apple the other day. Because I know Guy was front row for their developers yes, conference. always out was. there. So it's all those products that were kind of, you know, when, when the market, when stocks stop going up on, I didn't even pay attention, new laptop, this, all this stuff. when things stop acting that way, it's a sign to me. I like, saw that a lot in 2001. Stock stopped going up on perception of launching a product. But for Apple to start to look for other ancillary ways to capture service revenue, and this is a way to do it, and it's not a dumb way to do it, and it's actually an easy grab to do it. It told me that they're starting to change the kind of the revenue profile a little bit. And to your point, Dan, Apple's hardware business, if you want to call it that, is probably behind and probably going to miss numbers again. So back to the buy now, pay later. It's pretty easy. It's a captive audience. It's on Apple Pay. It's in Apple Wallet and so forth. Where it will get interesting is when they go into the longer duration, buy now, pay later, using your Apple Pay anywhere it's accepted. And that is MasterCard and Goldman that's going to be providing as a bank, going to be in the rail that's going to be providing that. So that's a little bit different. But they're not launching until September. I always thought that the Affirm customer is probably not that customer anyway. Joke, short now, cover later. Affirm's down to 20 bucks. I mean, look where that stock has been. And Max Lefkin comes out and says, no, this is great. It's an affirmation of the industry. No pun intended, Affirm. No, he says that actually when any competitor does anything in the space. Right. But this may be the best mousetrap buy now, pay later model because you literally, Apple can say, we're shutting off your well, and there services. it is. That's what that's what I wanted to kind of get you to say because you know you started talking about this space when there was a lot of M and A activity in it last year, and you started to think it was a bit of fugazi, like the valuations on the firm. You know that this has been around forever. When you have a company like Apple who has so many touch points with their customers, they have an install base of a billion and a half users. You say to yourself. I mean, this thing could catch some steam. Yeah, and listen, the one thing that people will pay, they'll pay their car loan before their rent because they need their car to get to work. Apple has devices that people have that they cannot live without. So it'll be really interesting to see what type of collateral or what type of power they have over them. Yeah, you know, I wanted to make one other point. I had sat down with Gene Munster of Loop Ventures. He's on CNBC a lot. He was the ax in Apple or one of the axes in Apple for a very long time on OK Computer earlier in the week. So check it out in the podcast stores, people. But he and I had a really 
good conversation about all the evolutionary sort of hardware and, and software services slowing a little bit. And we talked a little bit about, you know, new entries. I will say this, pre-pandemic, Apple's gross margins got just below 38%. They're expected to be 43% this year. And I think that's a really important point. So if you're talking about the fact that the stock was trading at about 27 times to start this year, now with the stock down 20 some percent from those highs, trading about, I don't know, 23 and a half times 22 next with margins that have gone up five percentage points since the start of the pandemic. That's pretty impressive. So there's a price for Apple. I know, Guy, I know that you think that that's true. There's a price for Apple where I think it's a bit of a layup and it's not probably too far from here. Yeah, I don't think it's here. I don't think it's in the mid 140s. You no. know, we've done a decent job, I think, with Apple. You know, for the longest time, we thought it would get down to 138, those October lows. It got down to 138.80. It bounced. Now it's subsequently sold down to 132. Bounced. I think people are looking for the right price somewhere in the high teens, low 120s. We'll see if it gets there. If it does, in fact, get there, though, I think it's going to line up with that 3750, if not lower S&P that we've talked about for quite some time. The other thing we need to talk about, you know, I love going to the zoo as a kid. I will tell you without equivocation that the greatest zoo in the world is in the Bronx, New York. It is called, in fact, the Bronx Zoo. I always used to like to make a beeline to the big cats, Danny Moses, one of those big cats being tigers. I mentioned tigers because there's some really weird things going on with some of these tiger cubs. And we have Jeff Richards on from time to time. And they're going to be write downs now in the private equity world. That's coming to a theater near you. I don't know necessarily what it means, but it's something to be aware of, Danny Moses. Yeah. So I don't know if people were aware of the amount of privates, private investments that a lot of these large hedge funds have gotten themselves into over the last several years. And in some cases, it's over half the portfolio. So we saw an article on Bloomberg come out the other day about several of these funds. Some were Tiger themselves, and some were either Tiger spinouts or Viking spinouts. Co2 was a Tiger Cub, exactly. So these are people that are very smart, got big and too big. Because remember, when, you're, when your fund gets to 20, 30, 40 billion, you really lose your ability, one, to really run a balanced short portfolio. You effectively turn into a long only because what are you shorting other than an ETF indice like SPY or something just to balance out your portfolio? But I think they fell in love with, these, with the private equity markets and, and some of these private businesses. And it's funny, they all own a lot of the same stuff, a lot of the same names. And crazy enough, I think Fidelity and Wellington own some too, and they're the least impacted in terms of their overall AUM and what it means to them because the fees aren't as great for those. They're all marked at different prices. So there are certain assets that are being marked down. They're all using third-party pricing services. So that's a whole issue un- unto itself. But I want to go back to something I failed to mention last week. And that is the pay that these people make. And I'm not going to be a hypocrite here because I worked at a hedge fund. I was a partner in a hedge fund. And yes, you make fees on you know what whatever you can produce, you should make a fee upon. But we're talking Chase Coleman in 2020, making $3 billion. Yes, a portion of that was in return. A lot of that was in fees, right? You know, several, several hundred million dollars was in fees. And, you know, Gay Plotkin, who we all know ran Melvin Capital, $850 million. There's no clawback. So it's not their fault. It's not illegal. But it's just the point of when the, when the, when the sun is shining and you make, hey, that's great. But people need to pay attention to the size of these portfolios. So what's happening now? You want to know why J.P. Morgan stock may be down and some of these brokers we've talked about? I told you they're starting to lose their biggest clients. These people are their biggest clients. As a matter of fact, D1 borrowed $2 billion from J.P. Morgan against their private portfolio. I have no doubt they'll be able to pay that back, obviously, but then you have leverage on leverage. So it's just a little scary to me. And so a lot of these funds are what we call side pocketing, where they're limiting redemptions. But what's happening is people that are redeeming, and this is very key for people out there, they're forced to sell their public stocks to meet those redemptions. So you want to know why some of the stocks are getting killed in the NASDAQ it's be, or whatever these people own? So for people out there that don't understand and can look at these filings that come out quarterly for what people own, make no mistake, f- other funds already know those in real time. And they're seeing what these large funds that are getting redeemed upon own. And those are the stocks that are probably down the most. And let me end with something positive. Those may present the largest opportunity. Because some of these things are just getting watched, and some of these are probably good companies. I'm not going to name companies specifically here, but yeah, the Cubs have were, were hibernating in these private equity, and <laughs> now they're coming out, and it's not pretty. They're enjoying, they're not enjoying the vernal equinox, as you were talking about, guy. Yeah, the next iteration of that though is basically startup insiders, founders are trying to sell their shares. They've been able to do it extraordinarily successfully up until recently, and that seems to be sort of. I don't want to say freezing, but maybe seizing up a bit. What does that all mean in terms of secondary shares for some of these 
startup companies that were all the de rigueur, as they say, but now sort of fallen on hard times. So, yeah, there was an article guy in the information earlier, a prominent tech rag, was talking about how the doors are shutting for secondary sales in the private markets. I mean, listen, we've talked about this period and, and really tried to figure out where is the leverage in the system? What are the comparisons going back to like the financial crisis? Well, consumer balance sheets were in pretty good shape this time around. So we didn't have people taking out second mortgages and buying other homes and, you know, all that sort of stuff, right? So at this point, if you think about it, we've said pretty adequately, it's just it, the fact that rates were so low for so long, there was just a lot of malinvestment, right? And so the fact of the matter is that you've had all of these ridiculous valuations of companies that have gone public regular way or through SPAC, you've seen them correct. So if you're still in the private tech market and you didn't go public and you've seen what happened to the guys that did go public over the last couple of years, you're looking to cash out any which way you can, right? And so this also ties in a little bit to what Danny was just talking about with the crossover investing that we saw from very prominent, let's call it multi-strat hedge funds, very large ones that had primarily always been in the public markets and started over the last five years or so going aggressively into private tech, not being too particularly too uh, worried about valuation. And then there's the huge mutual fund complexes, Wellington, Fidelity, that sort of thing. And again, there's less of the risk there. So the story in the information today about the secondary market closing for insiders is really important because insiders at private tech companies, they don't make a lot of money. They don't make a lot of money until there's an exit or they can sell their stock, right, in the public markets. So if they don't have the ability to kind of cash out, then they don't have the ability to actually buy homes and do, you know, do all this sort of stuff. So to me, I think this is a story we're going to hear a lot more of over the course of the summer. And then the other aspect of this are going to be down rounds, okay? You're seeing term sheets being pulled for future rounds and down rounds. And that's a bad thing. I think that's the sort of thing that sets up for a bit of a hurricane. And again, it comes down to valuations. When nobody cared about valuations, everything was great. All these things were able to happen without any problem whatsoever. Now, as rates have gone higher, people are focused on valuations. And we're going to talk to Herb Greenberg in a few minutes as well about things like this. This is when the tide goes out and you see what people are wearing. Well, the tide's going out, folks. I will not let this week go by without commenting on the SEC. And let me go backwards for the SEC for a minute, the Security and Exchange Commission. For the last couple of years, let me just round this out, your comment on PE and all that. They were asking, begging, that the retail client, that the individual investor should start to have access to investments in the private equity world. I don't think that ever got formally streamlined. I think there's a couple of platforms that allow it. But just imagine, that's how bad the SEC is. The negative selection aspect, that if that was able to happen right now, just imagine how many shares would be able to be sold by these insiders, Dan, or some of these institutions. Oh, guess what I have? I'm, I found $100,000 worth of this. For you. Oh, did you? How lucky am I? Anyway, <laughs> so we came into this week with the SEC, hoping that Gary Gensler, who was speaking at the Piper conference about kind of payment for order flow and all this stuff, he was going to finally do something to change market structure. It was a whole lot of nothing, in my opinion. He said all the right things, but then deferred to his committees to keep exploring and wonder what the research is. And it's just it's disheartening. I'm done. I'm giving up on the government doing anything about anything that, you know, I think is should help the market because there's too many people in control. And there's people that have now switched teams, so to speak, within the payment for order flow world that are now trying to justify their reasons and saying, oh, it is not as bad as I thought it was over. It's bullshit. It's bad for the retail investor period. I just want to get that off my chest. That's a mini rot leading into my large rot today. And Guy and Dan, my large rod today is going to be basically investors' five stages of grief. So we all know the stages of grief that exist in this world. I'm not going to make light of real grief and stock market grief, but I think this is what's happening here. So the first stage is denial, right? And that denial stage is, to me, the Fed put is still alive and the Fed's going to blink, right? That's denial. Anger. Damn those short sellers. Damn the Federal Reserve. Damn Biden. Damn Russia. I knew I should have sold X, Y, Z. Why did I buy it back? FOMO. That's the anger part. Bargaining. If XYZ just gets back to where I bought it, I promise myself I will sell it. Okay, that's that's bargaining. So depression, we're almost there. Not in the Great Depression, so to speak, a stock market, but of investors being depressed. And lastly, acceptance. We're not there yet. But this happens, I think, down 20% from here in the market. And there's still too many signs of investors chasing or wanting to believe at this point, but we're getting closer. So those are the five stages. I think we're stuck between bargaining and depression. And so, we're, Dan, the good news is we're making our way through these five stages and we're going to be there soon. 
I think, again, you know, we've been talking about this, it feels like, all year long, because the last bear market we had was this kind of the reversal in, you know, February, March, April, May of 2020, and trillions of dollars of monetary and fiscal stimulus were promised to kind of fix the whole thing. I think a lot of people still forget what a protracted bear market feels like, right? And I think that if you've been an individual stock picker in growth over the last year and a half, you know very well what that feels like. But Again, just the S&P down less than 15% and the NASDAQ down less than 25%, it just feels like that large parts of the investment universe haven't gotten the memo yet. In a few minutes, we're going to talk to Herb, and one of the things we're going to talk to him about is being labeled this, that, and the other thing. And as I've mentioned a number of times, you know, a lot of times the three of us get labeled as perma bears. That's not true, because a few weeks ago, we tried to point out some of the opportunities on the long side. The problem is, as the weeks have gone by, things continue to come to fruition, things that we thought would happen, and quite frankly, some things that I didn't think would happen, but none of them, in my opinion, are particularly bullish. And Dan's talking about protracted bear markets. We might be on the precipice of one because, as I've said, one of the only reasons I thought the market rallied as violently as it did for years and years is because the Fed was there, this Fed put was in place. But quite frankly, it's not there, and I don't know when it's going to come in. I will tell you, I don't think it finds itself at 3750 in the S&P 500. I think it's there, but I think it's a long ways away from where we're currently trading. And that's just my two cents. And I'm sure Herb will have some views on that as well. The first Saturday of May, as a lot of people realize, is a Kentucky Derby. This year, it was as late as it could possibly be, followed by the Preakness Stakes. We're not going to have a Triple Crown winner this year, Danny Moses, but we will have a Beaumont Stakes winner this Saturday. Speak to me about that race, the longest race of the three in the Triple Crown. Yeah, so it's a mile and a half. So a lot of horses don't ever make it to this. Horses that are bred for distance, as we say. This is the longest of the three. Let me just say this, and I say this in investing, and I say it in horses. I don't look at the odds first before I look at the horses. So just because I may come up with the favorite doesn't mean I got there because it was the favorite, if that makes sense. So I try to find some value here and give it to you guys. So the one horse, we the people. It won at Belmont in what was called the Peter Pan on May 14th by 10 lengths. Flavian Pratt, the jockey, finished second last year on this track. It is the son of Constitution, who is the son of Tappet. And Tappet has sired four Belmont winners. Bobby Flay owns a piece, so the restaurant could be hopping, right? And Windstar owns a piece of this thing. I like We the People at two to one. I'm going to skip the two horse, Skippy Longstocking. No, thank you. Here's an interesting one, Nest. The lone filly in the race, female horse, for those who don't understand this, came in second in the Oaks. It was my pick in the Oaks, came in second. Pletcher is the trainer here. His first Belmont win in 2007 was with a filly, rags to riches. I like this horse. It's eight to one. Rich Strike, who won the Derby, I don't believe in it. Going to pass on that one. Creative Minister, he's a closer, but Kenby Peaks, the trainer, don't like him. Going to pass on that. Six horse, Mo Donegal. I love this horse. I think the line right now is seven to two. He's a closer. Mike Rapoli owns a piece of this one, as well as Nest, by the way. He's the vitamin water guy. He's just a winner. This thing's a closer. A Rod Ortiz, the hottest jockey in the world, is riding Donegal. The seven is Golden Gilder, who lost to We the People and Peter Pan. I'm going to stay away from it. And the eight is Barbara Road. Very interesting horse, right? Rosario has won the Belmont twice, by the way, the jockey. So I like him, and he's a closer. So here's the, here's the bet. One, three, six, eight, trifecta box. One to win, and the three to win place and show. And you could do an exacta box, one, three, six, eight as well. If that nest gets up there in an exacta box or a trifecta box on top, that will pay a lot. So enjoy the Belmont, boys. Love the Belmont. Love you. We the people in order to form a more perfect union, establish <laughs> justice, Danny, and ensure domestic tranquility, a word that we are longing for in this very volatile world that we find ourselves in. When we come back, we're going to get to speak to somebody that I met 16 years ago, the great Herb Greenberg. With CME Group Micro Futures and Options, you can get the same access and capital efficiencies of the standard contracts with less upfront financial commitment. Diversify your portfolio and add flexibility by trading CME Group Micro Contracts in crypto, precious metals, FX, energy, and equity indices. Learn more about what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash micros. Risk Reversal Media would like to welcome iConnections, the world's largest capital introduction platform in the alternative investment industry, as a presenting sponsor of On the Tape. 
iConnections brings the asset management community together through a membership platform that lets allocators and managers meet and connect both physically and virtually. iConnections came to our attention in 2020 during the first wave of the pandemic. That's when their first event, Funds for Food, became the largest virtual cap intro event in history. To date, they've donated nearly $2.5 million to charities. They are also the people behind the alternative investment industry's largest and most exciting in-person events. From their annual Global Alts event in Miami to the upcoming Digital Assets Forum this June, the first of its kind designed to bring institutional investors into the world of crypto. To find out more about iConnections events and their members-only platform, visit iConnections.io. Hey, it's Dan here. I'm excited to tell you about a $1 billion app that's disrupting the way people like you and me invest. It's called Masterworks. They offer investors access to an estimated $1.7 trillion alternative asset that was once only accessible by the ultra-wealthy. I'm talking about blue chip art. Blue chip art has seen price appreciation that's outpaced the S&P 500 by 164% from 1995 to 2021. And the Wall Street Journal recently called it among the hottest markets on earth. It's no wonder the ultra rich like Jeff Bezos recently sold tons of Amazon stock and bought more art. And now you can too with the art investment app called masterworks.io. Join over 300,000 members for free on masterworks.io. Just go to masterworks.art slash tape. That's masterworks.art slash tape. See important disclosures at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. Herb Greenberg is a senior editor at Empire Financial Research. Greenberg spent more than 40 years as a financial journalist at some of the country's leading newspapers, websites, and broadcast media, where he covered almost every industry. He served as senior stocks commentator at CNBC, was a financial correspondent at the Chicago Tribune, and was senior columnist at TheStreet.com, just to name a few. I like to use big words, just big words, because it makes me sound smart, because as most of you come to realize, I'm not all that bright. But during the halcyon days of Fast Money, we used to do a segment called Street Fight with Herb Greenberg. And what I quickly came to learn about Herb is not only is he the kindest, most generous person that I met in my time at CNBC, he's also extraordinarily thoughtful, not just thoughtful in terms of what he's willing to do for other people, in terms of the work that he does. And one thing I said a couple of weeks ago, I think on Fast Money is we all like to get labeled. Actually, we don't like to get labeled. I think society likes to label us, whatever it is, and they're quick to make judgments. And I think in terms of Herb, He got labeled as a skeptic all the time. Quite frankly, I think being skeptical is really important. And I think history will tell you that some of the great headways we've made and some of the great improvements we've made are on the back of people that are skeptical. So, Herb, you know I'm a huge fan. Welcome to On the Tape. Guy, I am thrilled to be here. I think, as you know, I have listened to probably every one of these On the Tapes since you started. I have been a big fan since you started. I wouldn't have done it if it wasn't good. And I think what you guys did, I'm not trying to blow smoke here, I'm just trying to be realistic, is you put together a great team of, while you're all sort of skeptically inclined, you're different, and you come at it differently, and there's respectful disagreement, even though you're sort of on the same side of the way you think on certain things. So I really like that. So I've really been a fan. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to have you, Danny and Dan are as well. But just let me say this, you know, I mentioned being skeptical and I think it's extraordinarily important, but what I learned now 15 and a half or so years ago and what's come to really light lately is you get rewarded, unfortunately, for being lazy. And that must just really aggravate somebody like you who does extraordinarily thoughtful work. It takes extraordinary amount of time to do the work that you're doing and you're seeing people that don't have nearly the intellect or the curiosity that you do being rewarded for things that, quite frankly, they shouldn't be rewarded for? It's really hard because what I think I've learned, I learned it with my short service, with two short research services I had. I've learned it as a journalist talking to people. I like to get ahead of the curve. It's always been the DNA inside of me. I like to be early. And so say you come up with an idea where you think there's a problem. Well, as a journalist, you're not trading. You're just trying to come up with the information. As a short research service, you're trying to give people the heads up. 
because they're supposed to do their own research. They're supposed to get in there early. But what I realized is it doesn't necessarily work that way because the sad truth is many people on Wall Street simply find comfort in numbers and they want to be where their friends are, especially on the short side. They don't want to be early. They don't want to be first. They want to cite the numbers that show, I'm sure appropriately so from academic studies, that on the short side of things, higher short interest names equal better returns. And given the way shorting works, I suspect that's correct. I don't short stocks. There's that. I just do the research or did the research. I don't do that anymore for the most part. But I think that that is probably the great eye opener and the great disappointment I found, because I think there are a lot of good ideas out there, but you don't get paid for being early. You get paid for making money and making money in a market where hedge funds, I think many of them have become reluctant to take chances because of the ridiculous pay schemes they have, which you got to be paid by the end of the year. If you haven't performed correctly, you're not going to get paid. So people don't take risks. It all just works against itself. So that's a long-winded way of saying I agree with you. It's frustrating. It was very frustrating. And it's one of the reasons, you know, as I've made this shift, we'll see how this one sticks. It's pretty interesting just away from that and away from Wall Street being what Wall Street is. You kind of paved the way for a lot of short sellers, knowing that there's people out there like you that are doing the work that they're doing, validating a lot of the things that they are. And I've always said, sometimes your best longs, things you want to own, are your best short covers. And sometimes the opposite is true. Your best shorts are your best long sale at the same time. So I think you bring a lot to the table there. I'm just worried that from a behavioral finance perspective, that we've now lost you at the time where we're going to need you the most at the time where the tide is going out. And I get it because if you're short and wrong on the sell side as a sell side research channels, you lose your job. If you're short and you're right on the stuff that you're doing, it's great. 90% of the people don't pay attention. They want to fight it till the very end. And then you realize that a lot of the people in the investing community that are going to be paying you are out of business because they got killed and didn't listen. How do you balance that? And tell me that from a contraindicator perspective, when I say the dark side, I'm not talking about the long side, but how you balance it at a time where I believe I've read up on the stuff you've been doing. You had a couple of health scares. I know you just had a big birthday. Happy birthday, by the way. That you've come to this realization when we need you the most. Help me, Herb. It really comes down to the business of what I was doing. And arguably, by me making the switch, that is going from a short research firm to then just a Scaramucci minute doing activist short selling, where I was there for three months before I saw the light. And then going to uh, long bias newsletters geared to uh, retail investors, arguably when I did that, it was the top of the market. I would say I was just a few months away from top ticking the market when I made that change, and I knew it. There's also a business component to it, and there's a human component to it. And when you sit there and you're providing short research, and every day you're going into the office while I'm home, I'm dealing with this every day with my colleagues, and you're feeling stupid. Everything you're trying is not working, and you're seeing the business take a hit as a result of that, and you wonder, is it going to come back, or is the end market just changed? I decided to weigh the dynamics that we knew shorting was going to come back, or at least stocks were going to fall. But the end market that we were providing our research to, in my estimation, I wasn't willing to wait for it to possibly rebound. And I didn't want to continue dealing with the constant negativity, everything I had to look at was you had to find some flaws. You know, as I turned 70 years old, or I was veering toward that age at that point, I was thinking, come on, there's got to be a better way, because here's the other way to look at it. When I was doing the research on the short side, my last firm working with Don Vickery and Linda McDonough, who were fantastic. Don's one of the great forensic analysts out there. One thing you did is you, I didn't do the financials. I did the business side of things. And I like researching businesses. I like businesses. I found that I was doing that work and I thought, well, why not turn around and just research businesses where you think there actually may be some undervaluation and you can enjoy the research of the business. You can actually say, hey, this is a really neat business. And boy, these guys, for whatever reason, are misvalued. And that's something I really enjoyed. So I figured I would put it to work. Now, that said, doing the long biased work scared like the devil of being bamboozled because of everything I know. Maybe it's that I know too much, and that scares me. And so my DNA is always going to be skeptical. It's who I am. But 
if you're not getting paid for doing the work, I'm not running a charity here, why do it? And plus, there's the mental aspect of it in terms of just, again, people who know me would say I'm the most optimistic, positive, negative guy they know. Which is a great thing for you, Randy Van Warmer fans out there. I know there are a lot of you. Dan mentioned, or it was Danny that mentioned, Just When I Needed You Most, a great song for you Yacht Rock fans. I can do the lyrics if you want her, but I'll spare you. But it's interesting, skepticism, you can find great opportunities on the long side being skeptical. You can look at companies and say, I don't understand why the street, why investors are not giving this company their just due. And you found it in a number of different undervalued, underappreciated industries. Can you sort of speak to that? You're talking about right now, right? Absolutely. We tend not to talk names because people have paid money for this. But that said, from the moment we started doing this, and I work with several other people. So I work with There's a guy who I work closely with, but he's more of an under-the-radar guy. His name's Gabe Marshank. And Gabe used to be at Greenlight for many years. He was at SAC for many years. He's been around. And Enrique Abeda, who is just an interesting guy all the way around. He's been a hedge fund guy. And Bernard Barche, who's one of the best consumer analysts, I think, out there. And Whitney Tilson, who generally doesn't need any introduction. So the issue is, and I'll give you an example. You find a company like Hillenbrand. Now, the minute I say Hillenbrand to you, Caskets. Immediately, I think of caskets. I'm just telling you, that's where my head goes. Exactly. You think of caskets. That's what everybody says when they think of Hillenbrand. Except, guess what? While nobody was watching and Wall Street was doing its classic, they're just a casket maker. Nobody was watching the company transition itself, using the money the caskets generate to move into a totally different area. Plastics extrusion equipment. They kind of own the market for various types of quality of equipment that generates plastics exclusion. This company generates a ridiculous amount of cash. And if you had any concern, it's that management, which has a history of being fairly conservative, blows it on the cash. And what I found fascinating on the last conference call is listening to management just over and over use the word discipline, 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 because they know people are so concerned they're going to misuse the cash they have and go out and buy something stupid. But my point is this. To me, that's fun. It's fun to find a company like that, to know that it's mischaracterized by Wall Street, and to know that it has, we believe, good upside potential, but there's a beauty to what we do. We're not in this because we're not running a hedge fund. We're doing research for newsletters. This is a longer-term opportunity, and someone's going to recognize it. It's either going to be the company or someone else. But meanwhile, they're just generating great returns for shareholders, not as the stock price isn't reflecting it right now, but they're doing it internally through their dividends and their buybacks and their share count continuing. If I go back and look at it, I think it's falling. Could you imagine if the one word that that young graduate was given was caskets, not plastics, caskets, nobody, nothing. I got it. Dustin, all right, but he said caskets, then he said plastics, so it works, okay? Well, if you went a funeral parlor, no one would die. That's right. You just combine like four movies with one thing. Go ahead. All right, Herb. So we started this podcast, I think the first on the tape was January 15th, 2021. And at the time, it was a full-on mania. It was crypto, it was NFTs, it was unprofitable tech IPOs, it was SPAC issuance, it was meme stocks, it was like a free-for-all. And Danny, Guy, and I, I mean, we couldn't wait to turn the mics on. Let's be frank. Put in some sort of context. Now, I have been reading you since you were on the street. Dot com. I remember when you were doing Market Watch. I remember when I started doing CNBC in 09, you were popping on, and then you were popping on frequently, I think, throughout the 2010s. And you always had just a really unique thing to say about whatever the mania that was going on at the time. All of those manias converged. And since I've been in the business for 25 years, we've seen bits and pieces of all of them, but they're all kind of happening at the same time, at least from like a sentiment standpoint. Put it in some context, what we witnessed, because Danny Guy and I, I think that sort of behavior really informed our broader market thoughts, despite the fact that the NASDAQ or the S&P weren't confirming them at all in 2021, but we were fairly well convinced that we were on a precipice of something. So give us a sense. I know there's been a lot of comparisons between 
2000 and then the run up to the dot com implosion. Where are we and how does all these converging manias and the unwind of them over the last, let's call it 18 months of many of them, how is that stacked up against some other stuff that you witnessed in your very nice long career? Well, in my long career, I mean, I have the obvious one was the one everybody else cites because I lived it, which was the dot com era and watching it go up. And I go back and look at stories I wrote in 1996 and 1997 and the fighting of that battle. The difference is that was a battle of the dot com stocks. That was the battle of the creation of the Internet and everybody finally getting all in and everybody feeling they were left out and other companies that weren't dot com. My favorite was iOmega. And when the periodontist was about to put the needle in my mouth and he tells me he's bought iOmega and I was writing about iOmega every other day, that was a company that made zip drives. My point is that the difference now is that there's always a FOMO in an event like that. That was a FOMO. This is a FOMO, fear of missing out. But the difference now is that everybody turned around and saw everybody making money some way easily. Whether it was the kid who was theoretically minting a million dollars and buying his $2 million house in Southern California with his cryptocurrency, or it was someone just stepping in the front of some meme stock that who knew, or it was just everything but real companies, everything but the Hill and Brands. Everyone was forced into, rates were so low, put yourself in the shoes of someone my age. You're making zero money at the bank. You're making zero money in a money market. And you're sitting there, and if you're like me, you're conservative, and you're watching everybody else. But put yourself in the shoes of anyone and everyone, such as the relatives of the hedge funds, the clients I used to have who I would talk to, and they would say, they're getting phone calls from all of their relatives who know nothing about the stock market, talking about the stock market, talking about what should I buy? It seemed like it was everyone and it became fun and everybody was making money. And what I talked to people about, I'd go, yeah, but it's not sustainable. And that was the message that didn't get across this time. And I'm sure it was the message that didn't get across before. But the difference is it was so many different types of things. And then when the SPACs came along, I mean, no one knew what a SPAC was unless you had followed blank check companies in the past and everyone wanted in. I'm listening to you talk and so many things go through my head about being forced down the risk curve. But what you just described when I was a kid, obviously Jaws came out and there was a scene in the movie when Matt Hooper first appears on the scene and there's seven or eight assholes piling into a boat. And he says, you know where I can find a restaurant? And all those guys say, yeah, just keep walking straight. And they laugh at him because they're, and he says to himself, you're all about to die. He saw what was coming but they didn't see what was coming. And it just makes you crazy. And I'm sure it made Richard Dreyfus crazy. I know it made Matt Hooper crazy. And I guarantee it made you crazy and still makes you crazy. But there's no way to get to those people, I guess, is the point. They don't want to hear from you because they want to believe what they want to believe. They don't want to hear from you because nobody knows when this stuff ends. And we never know. Nobody knows. You guys didn't know. Nobody knew. So it became the greater fool theory. But here's the beauty of this greater fool theory. This greater fool theory fooled everybody. It fooled all the smart guys. I mean, whether it was the smart guys, everybody, respectable people, people who weren't so respectable, starting their SPACs, everybody thought that they would get in, the empty bag would be held by some retail guy over here. You talk to smart guys, I have guys calling me and saying, the game has changed, you got to play the game. And you say, well, what are you going to do when the game changes again? Don't worry about that because they figured they'd get out. Well, this is the one that trapped almost everybody in some sense, in some way. It sucked in everybody. But they all thought, especially the smart guys, the so-called smart guys, they all thought they'd get out first. And they didn't. I mean, look at all the guys that got trapped that are still trapped at $10 in SPACs by being part of the sponsorship, by being part of the pipe deals. Everybody. Let me just back up here a little bit, because I totally respect the fact that you need to run a business. But at the same time, it's hypocritical, not that you're a hypocrite, it's hypocritical because the whole idea of Wall Street of being long and raising capital and all that stuff is that they also have to run a business. So not say you're giving in, but I would say, I would go out on a limb and say that any longs that you recommend are value because you've obviously screened them from the skeptical side in order to even get to the point. I get it. 
But what we found or what I found working, you know, with Steve, Vinny and Porter, whenever we find a long that we like, nine times out of 10, it may be great long, but it turns out to be what we call a value trap. And the reason it's a value trap is the reason you just described why Wall Street firms don't go to it. I'm guessing Hillebrand does not raise capital. I'm guessing Hillebrand doesn't pay the street a lot in fees. I look at the four analysts that cover it, CJS Securities, nothing against them, whatever, Barrington, this, that, and the other. So they're under the radar screen. So you're trying to produce these gems. But I like 68 and a half year old her because this is the time I feel you just described a situation that there was an environment that was too good to be true. And you're having Fraud Fest 2022. Is it still called Fraud Fest? Fraud Fest 2022. Can I still count on you to find and talk about these things? Because we can't afford, I think investors can't afford, I mean this, to lose your brain on the short side because there are still opportunities out there for people, forget about going short, for people to sell on. So if you're pushing a hill and brand, let's say to somebody, why wouldn't you at the same time say, if you're looking to raise cash or switch it in, this is what I would sell without labeling a company as a short. Maybe it's in the same industry. Maybe they have some type of harsh accounting or something. You're making a good point. One thing, because since everybody I work with is short biased by nature, we talk about doing shorts or at least putting them out there. Shorts, unfortunately, and I've learned this by trying it. The retail environment doesn't even care about what to avoid. We do what to avoid. In fact, we're launching a new product soon on bigger household names, just good companies to own. I'm doing it with Berna, Barche. And one of the things I'm going to do is five companies to avoid. When we launched my product, we had a companies to avoid part of that. Just something we put out there just because that's who we are. But look, Danny, if I thought there was a way for me to continue going and make a really good living doing what I spent 40 years doing, I would have done it. When I went into the activist short selling side of things thinking, you know what, I've tried everything in my career. I love trying new things. It's what keeps me going. When I tried that, I thought, you know what, I can use my skills. We can find some really bad companies. But it turned out what I was finding with the guy I was working with, and we weren't paid to do this. You're only paid if the deal is done. So we were doing it for free. What I, we found is we found some great fundamental short ideas, but we couldn't even talk about them because that wasn't the mantra. That wasn't what the hedge fund we were working through. That's not what they were doing. So we were sort of stuck just working for free and finding ideas that no one was doing anything with. Look, that's genuinely what I like. But now we can turn it around. You try to use those skills to find companies, whether Hillenbrand is a value trap or not a value trap is for investors to decide and disagree over because we've seen things happen with companies like that. This is a company that's moving forward as far as I'm concerned. And I love the fact that it has little coverage. I mean, my God, that's what investing used to be, Danny. I mean, what am I missing here? Nothing except when you have buy rated stocks that 60 analysts cover a stock and it's all buys. It's the opposite. I totally hear you. I get it. You're always fighting. But isn't that the exciting thing? Look, I just wrote about a company that all fundamental analysts have given up on company called Allison Transmission. You've owned it at some point in your career. I love the company. All you do is do the research on the company. You realize it's a company that it doesn't get the love from anyone but the quants because it's not ESG enough. And so I look at that and I go, these guys have bought back 40% of their share over the past X number of years since they've gone public. They just generate so much cash. And the EV part of the story is so misunderstood by Wall Street as it relates to them. So I get excited about that. Now, is the stock going to be stuck in the mud for the next five years? I hope not. Herb, real quick, I'm listening to this and I say all the time, not only am I a participant in these podcasts, but I'm also a listener as well. And I hear in Danny's voice, you are Danny's Mickey Mantle. You are his Tenzig Norgay. So when you divert <laughs> even just the slightest to do something that doesn't line up with him, he's devastated. I can hear it in his voice. And I have to tell you, and I'm not speaking for Danny, but that's the highest possible praise he can give you. Anyway, please continue, Herb. <laughs> it's like what Guy said. And what you said last week or two weeks ago, you said people are cast a certain way. You sort of referred to it at the beginning of the show. I stressed so much about making this change and not just making a change, but making it with newsletters where the marketing is aggressive, that kind of stuff. I probably got more gray hair just from stressing over that. Because what will people think? And then people, my family and others, close friends would say, why do you care what people will think? And I said, well, because I spent 40 plus years building my reputation on being a guy who has developed some pretty good instincts at this and loves, I love, love, love collaborating with people on ideas because my strengths 
aren't necessarily because it's the left brain versus the right brain. If you've got the right brain going on and then you're working with somebody who has the left brain, you end up with some really good work. And as we used to do at Pacific Square, we'd say, my God, the three of us are challenged to work on this. How does one person do it? And we're all coming at it from different perspectives. I love that. Love it, love it, love it. We'll always miss it. But if it doesn't pay the bills, what's the point? So I also love finding these other things. That said, I hear you, Danny. I hear you. And I've tried to keep my voice involved in a lesser of a way with some free things I put out once or twice a week just to stay in the mix and keep that part of me fresh. I actually have more fun just trying to research some of the companies coming up with the names. We spend a lot of time trying to come up with the right names because I write once a month on the paid product. But you raise a good point. As we mentioned, Herb, you just turned 70. And I said at the top, I'll say it now, your work's incredible. But I think one of the things that you're most, not fearful, but one of the things that just really, I think, gets in your craw is the notion of being bored with something. And I think when you find yourself bored, you more than most people, I think a lot of people just resign to the fact that that's what life has in store. You're not one of those people. Every time you get in a rut, let's put it that way, you pivot, you make a move, you do something. How difficult is that is for a lot of people myself included, you find yourself sometimes in that rut, but you just don't allow yourself, you don't have the courage to get out of it. Can you speak to that? Because I think it is courageous. I just hate missing out on an opportunity and doing the same thing over and over and over. And to an outsider, it's like when you saw Seinfeld. I'm not comparing myself to Seinfeld. When you saw the show Seinfeld and people would say, God, how could he stop? And he stopped at a certain point because it wasn't the same anymore for him. When you're doing something, I did a column for 10 years in San Francisco on top of the world, really enjoying it. But yet it was getting to be a grind. When I had a column in Fortune at the same time for seven years, I tried to give that up two years before finally they said, we don't need you anymore because it was just getting to be a grind. When you're doing something in the public eye, people, again, think of you doing that. They want it to continue. But if you're not having fun doing it, I always say, use the line, you're not in prison. You can do whatever you want to do. And so for me, it's taking some chances with my career and took a chance leaving a business that I created and co-founded. And that was a hard thing to do, to just literally walk away. But I thought there was something better. And then that something better didn't turn out to be what I expected it to be. But when I did it, I said, what's the worst that could happen? And the worst that could happen was that I fail. And then I thought, well, something else might come along and something else had shown itself early in the process, but something else came along. And here I am at the age of 70 and I can't imagine not doing something because I like being engaged. I don't like to be bored. I don't like to be isolated. And so I call my shots with that. And I've always viewed my job as a business. Back to when I was columnist in San Francisco, my salary I viewed as revenue, and I viewed myself as somewhat entrepreneurial, but I guess it was more entrepreneurial because I'm not the greatest entrepreneur out there, but yet I think that's all part of it. And here's the interesting part. I'm not a risk taker trading-wise with stocks. I'm much more conservative. I would consider myself high risk uh, with career. Herb, are you coming to New York for this fraud fest? You know, unfortunately, my grandson's birthday is the day before. I was hoping to grab you. And then Guy will probably remember this reference. Find Donald Sutherland from Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Kill wherever that pod is located in that gym, whatever those bodies were sitting in, and bring you back because investors need you and the world needs you. And I have no doubt that any long that you push, I mean this, has to be a good company because all the skill set that you've had over the years, there's no doubt. And I'm sure they'll work over time. They're probably going to outperform this market over the next several years. It scares the daylights out of me that one of my short friends will be short a company that we did. And that's probably frightens me more than anything. The best longs for me have always been the most heavily shorted names that you think you have an angle on because what people don't realize in the long only community and really retail Reddit community is if you believe in something, and I think GameStop's the wrong one to believe in, but let's just use that as an example because Fundamentals will never catch up to it. But what a powerful force it is to have 90% of the float short, knowing that that is demand that has to come at some point. So if the company can put up, then it's just a massive windfall. Same for some of your longs, I'm sure you're mentioning that are 
value traps normally have a decent short interest in it. So that is a huge catalyst. Well, these don't. And I'm specifically hoping to find those that don't. And that's the challenge of it. But look, I genuinely think that after everything we went through, after everything we went through, with the memes and the SPACs and everything, and everybody getting partially obliterated on some of it, there is a reversion to, as I call, real companies that make real things for real people. And I really believe that. There's something to be said for that. And whether that translates into companies, they may not be companies that double overnight or that even ever double. But whatever happened to the time when investing was slower and steady, and it's that chart that people have shown over and over now, that you could look at the NASDAQ and you could compare it to Berkshire Hathaway. And you watch both of those over the course of this craziness. And Berkshire trailed, trailed, trailed. And guess what? They both ended up at the same place. And one probably just caused less heartache and less emotional stress. You know, I always say, when I'm talking with our portfolio we're trying to create, I don't want to have to think about the stocks I have in my 401k or my IRA, my, my retirement account. I don't want to think about those when I'm on vacation. I don't want to think about them when I'm driving up the five to the Bay Area. I don't want to think about them. And that's sort of the approach I'm taking. It That probably doesn't resonate with you. You guys manage money or you did manage money and you're at a much higher level of intensity than some of the average folks are. They may not get as rich as you, but they still will be able to enrich themselves. And so I think that's something that gets lost in the story of Wall Street. Because we all forget what investing used to be. And there's this other side to it as well. Herb, we met 16 years ago. And one of the first things I learned about you was you didn't suffer fools, but I always appreciated that you made the exception for me. So thanks for joining us here on the tape, Herb. Thanks, Herb. You're welcome. This has been great. This has been a pleasure. Thanks once again to CME Group for sponsoring this episode of On the Tape. If you liked what you heard, make sure you hit follow and leave us a review. It helps people find our show and we love hearing from you. And we also want to hear from you via email at onthetape at riskreversal.com any time of the day. Follow and connect with us on Twitter at On The Tape Pod, and we'll see you next time. On The Tape is a Risk Reversal media production. This podcast is for informational purposes only. All opinions expressed by me, Dan Nathan, Guy Adami, Danny Moses, and any other participants are solely our opinions and should not be relied upon for specific investment decisions. Mm-hmm.